hi guys and welcome back to my channel thank you for joining me again if this is your first time here please hit that subscribe button and i hope you all enjoy the video So the reason why I wanted to make this video is not because I'm controversial, but because the more people keep talking about this topic, I realize that I have a lot of questions and I have a lot of confusion when it comes to this topic as a whole. Now, by now, we all know how this conversation tends to go. You have people who are pro-life and people who are pro-choice. Now, people who are pro-life, the crux of their stance really has to do with their religious beliefs and their moral beliefs that says that this is an innocent life that needs to be protected. People who are pro-choice, the crux of their stance is to say that this is not a religious issue it's not a moral issue and that it's more really a healthcare issue and that a woman should be given the choice to say whether she's going to keep her pregnancy or terminate her pregnancy but that she should be given the choice and that when making that choice she doesn't need to explain it to anyone or seek anyone's permission or approval now the way I tend to approach most things is that I tend to try and understand another person's point of view. This isn't about agreeing or disagreeing. The truth of it is that I never want to be stuck in my own echo chamber where I'm hearing my own thoughts or I'm even just surrounded by people who have the same perspective and same view on things as I do. So I like to hear different perspectives and open myself up to different points of view from people because it helps me understand things better and to be quite honest I think that the only way to truly engage a person is to understand their point of view I think it's foolish to think that you can have a conversation or a debate with someone without at least understanding their point of view or where it is that they're coming from at least a debate that's going to be had in good faith of course the truth also is that I think when we have proximity with people who are different to us or people who who have different points of views and perspective to us I think proximity with people like that is that within us it breeds a lot of compassion and empathy which I think is so important especially in the times that we're in right now that when we're engaging with each other to always have compassion and empathy distance doesn't allow for that at all now whenever people from these two different groups have a conversation around this topic it always ends in the same way nowhere at least for me anyway and what i've noticed is that whenever people have this discussion is that people never actually take the time to ask why and to understand why is it that women get to the point of choosing to terminate their pregnancy and i realize that a lot of that has to do because each side isn't really interested they just want to win an argument you know for their side and more often than not i think about what is a way where this conversation can be had where something new and meaningful can actually be brought to this conversation because when i think about myself the why is important right because i'm like has it the question ever really been asked you know to say what are the circumstances what are the conditions that are leading women to get to the point of saying that she's going to terminate her pregnancy and and then with that in mind, the question that then says, okay, what policies and laws can be put into place in order to address some of these concerns, right? Because when I think about it, I'm like, the people who are pro-life, shouldn't their cause really be to get to a point where an abortion is unnecessary, right? Because I think by making it unavailable, it doesn't make it unnecessary because the reasons and the concerns that women have for why they terminate will still be there. So making it unavailable doesn't make it unnecessary. The truth is that women have a lot of reasons. The reasons are many and they're wide ranging and the reasons are not the same for you know all women. But what's become very clear here is that people that fall on either side of this discussion is that they aren't really that interested in the reason why. So I want you to explore some of the reasons, particularly the ones where certain decisions have been made that have me confused. Now I'm in no way saying that these are the only reasons, but I'm just using these ones because there's some things in them that have me confused so the first one being birth control now i know we can all sit up here and say you know what people should be practicing practicing abstinence and for the people who practice abstinence i love that but we also have to be realistic and honest with ourselves and know that people are having sex now i'm a firm believer in sex education i think sex education is important but sex education also that's all encompassing so sex education that talks about abstinence but also sex education that talks about all forms of birth control now because we know that people are going to have sex I think it's important that people be educated on how to have sex safely and also how to have access to affordable birth 
uh, control options. But this has proved challenging, particularly in the United States, because under the Trump administration, which by the way was not that long ago, and this was I think one day before the midterm election, they released final rules that were basically saying that employers could opt out of providing health care that covered birth control. Now the problem with this is that it left thousands and thousands of women without access to birth control, which they were able to afford before with the health insurance. But without that health insurance, it became really expensive for a lot of women. Even when I consider here in South Africa, many healthcare facilities have been talking about how they've been experiencing on and on shortages of contraceptives, from oral contraceptives to injectables. Nurses have had to tell women that the choice of their contraceptive is unavailable. Now, why is this important? I was reading a research paper that was done by Washington University School of Medicine and it basically says that where there is access to free birth control, it reduced the abortion rates from between 62 to 78%. That's a lot. But when I think about it, I'm like, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense, right? Because we're saying, okay, people are having sex, right? But when they've got various birth control options, it gets to the point where they are not getting pregnant, which then means that they're not right. So this is something that kind of makes a lot of sense to me, which is why then when you see these restrictive laws and policies being passed that are making it difficult for people to access birth control options, it has me confused, right? Because surely the laws and the policies should work the other way to say, okay, if this is going to reduce abortion rates, let's make sure that people actually have access to birth control, right? The second one I want to talk about is money. Well, not really money, but more so affordability. I was reading a research paper by the uh, Good Matcha Institute, and I know I'm probably saying that wrong, but that's the research arm of Planned Parenthood. And they conducted a survey where they talked to about 1,200 women who had come in for an abortion. And 73% of them had said that the reason why they chose to have an abortion is because they simply could not afford having the child. So I thought about that and I'm like, okay, here's an instance, right, where a reason has been given. So then shouldn't they be thinking around, okay, what law and policy can be put into place to sort of address this, to help alleviate that concern? So as I was reading up, I realized that there's a senator in Alabama. Her name is Linda Coleman. She put a bill forth towards um, Alabama to say that the state needs to be providing free prenatal care. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, great. So this sort of addresses the concern. So you would think that this would be something that gets passed, right? But no, that bill was struck down. I think when it came down to voting was like 23 to six. And this is the thing that confuses me because I'm like here, you had a bill that would be addressing the concerns or the costs of neonatal care, you know, child care and other expenses like food and clothing. So I'm like, I don't understand why, you know, they wouldn't want that bill to pass. And I get it. This is the part where people would be like, well, you know, if you have a child, you're responsible for taking care of that child. <sighs> So a lot of women have also said that part of the reason why they get to the point of making the decision to terminate is that a lot of them aren't really sure or secure about the state of their relationship. A lot of women have also said that they felt pressure from their partners with their partners sometimes giving them an ultimatum that says that if you don't terminate, you're going to be doing this alone. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to opt out. So it's all of that pressure and, and the concerns and the anxiety of not even just financially you know being the sole person who's going to be taking care of the child but everything else falling completely on you and i absolutely agree that yes if you're going to make a child you absolutely are responsible for taking care of that child but i think that we need to talk about men who then walk away right because we look at the stats we look at the issue of fatherlessness you know we see you know all the things that people have to say about deadbeat dads and we cannot not talk about that as well because it's not enough for men to get women pregnant and then to simply walk away without realizing that if you're going to get someone pregnant if you're going to be involved you have to be involved as well in taking care of that child so that means being there physically mentally emotionally 
or in all of the ways all encompassing but the truth about it is that men are able to opt out and the society that we live in has made it easy for men to opt out because society picks up the slack when men opt out you know if men are like well I don't want to do this they know that there's a, a mom a dad a grandpa an auntie an uncle a cousin somebody somewhere is gonna pick up the slack for them so my question is what are the consequences for men who decide that they're not going to step up the truth is that this is a complicated and nuanced issue for me for me i'll speak for myself to say that i will be honest to say that there is some complications for this as far as i'm concerned and the truth about it is that there are so many reasons that women give and i know people who are pro-choice don't even like to talk about that people who are pro-choice are like no reason is even necessary if a woman doesn't want to have a child that is enough the thing about it though is that the reasons that women are giving cannot be ignored you know we simply cannot push them to the side because my question really is why are we not seeing any thinking around what can be done to address some of these reasons you know from fathers walking away from cultural perceptions of birth control to the ease and the access of getting birth control you know to the cost of health care where women can't afford certain health care but when politicians have the power to vote in certain laws to make it possible they simply won't do it my thing is irrespective of which side you fall on this when i hear all of these things i'm like everybody should be advocating to make things better because the bottom line is that if you want people to make better choices you need to give them better options so speaking about options let's talk about adoption now this is one that i know people who are pro-life like to put out there as a viable option to say if you don't want to have your child instead of terminating you can always put that child up for adoption because there are lots of people who want to be able to have children but can't have children and all of those things and i know that people who are pro-choice the reason why they are the reason why they push back with to that is to say that there's still then the expectation that has been placed on a woman that she needs to carry this child to term and give birth a child that you know the woman might not necessarily want just so it can people can have the conversation of adoption i know that that's you know the perspective that people who are poor choice have but even when we talk about adoption the truth of the matter is that the law falls short even for people who want to consider this as an option now during the trump administration which again was not that long ago there was a rule that was proposed to say that foster care and adoption agencies could deny services to lgbtq families and the reason that they could give or the reason that they could use is saying that it goes against their religious beliefs and moral conviction so essentially they could turn down people who are same-sex couples single mothers and people who are in interfaith couples and they could turn them down by saying that well if we approve this application it goes against our religious views and our moral convictions therefore we can't approve the application another instance where my confusion kicks in people are always like don't terminate you can always give your child up for adoption there's so many people who want to parent and i'm like well here are people are veiling themselves and saying that they want to parent but the system is saying that they don't want those particular people to parent it just absolutely blows my mind because if anything it just means that more children will be left in the foster care system now before people get confused i'm in no way saying that people should terminate because the abortion system System is terrible what I am saying though is to say that people who are pro-life should you not be advocating you know for the reform of the adoption system should you not be advocating to say hey there are people who want to adopt these children let them be able to adopt the the children should you not be saying okay what reform what changes can be brought to the system what laws what policies can be written in to say that when people are really willing and able to adopt they should be so all all of this red tape and all of these challenges that are put in people's ways when they're trying to adopt children i'm like where is the campaigning where is the work and the fighting to make sure that that's not the case to make sure that the adoption process is is, is a simple one because like i was saying earlier you want people to make better choices give them better options and this is what i mean when i say that around this whole entire topic it's just about i just want to have a different conversation you know because the conversation is just always the same 
how people have it like this side and this side but there's so many other things within this conversation that i'm like let's just spend some time and talk about stuff like that but the truth about the matter is that this topic is one that is heavily politicized you know politicians use it to score points across political lines and within their own parties and the thing is much like the texas law i think we're going to be seeing a lot of these laws not just in the united states but in other parts of the world as well and the thing is some of these laws really don't make a lot of sense to me like when i consider in georgia they wanted to pass a bill that was the hb 481 it was passed but then was later repealed so what this law was basically saying that you know it didn't allow for abortion if a person was pregnant beyond six weeks and that if you violated this you could face prison for up to 10 years and that is hectic to me because it's essentially saying that could you imagine like a rapist getting less time in prison than the woman he raped if she chooses that she was going to terminate the pregnancy that is hectic and i think when people see things like that in the law it causes a lot of confusion which it does for me as well but i think the other thing also with these kinds of laws that have me confused and people who are pro-life and champion these laws is that these laws are still saying that if you find out that you're pregnant before the six week mark you can have an abortion so then it's not really pro-life right because if exceptions are being made can it be pro-life or when there's certain clauses in these laws that say well you know if it will jeopardize a mother's life or a mother's health then termination would be allowed is it really pro-life then and I think that's my confusion is like, if there are exceptions, can people who really truly support these things and be championing innocent lives, can they really support it and say that it's pro-life? So I wanted to talk about the Texas law, you know, and what the Texas law is actually saying and what it's about. So what the Texas law basically says is, is that if you are pregnant six weeks and beyond, you cannot terminate your pregnancy. So by the time a person is six weeks pregnant that essentially means that you've maybe missed your period for about two weeks like your period has been late for about two weeks and the thing is most women don't track their period so they don't know you know the beginning date and the end date and because a big part of that is that periods are irregular for a majority of women so by the time a woman discovers that she's pregnant she would easily be well over the six weeks so even if she wanted to do something about that within this new texas law she wouldn't be able to now i know that people also make mention of a heartbeat and i was reading this article where doctors and OBGYNs were basically explaining the medical implications of that and what it actually means when people are talking about a heartbeat at six weeks but i'll put that article in the description and you can read more about it now this law does something very very interesting in terms of enforcement so it leaves enforcement up to private citizens so regular people right it leaves enforcement to them through civil litigation and not criminal prosecutions so what this basically means is that private citizens are just going to be monitoring each other like people are going to be watching to see what other people are doing this law effectively says that a private citizen can sue a texas abortion provider right for violating the law but that it can also sue anyone who aids and abets a woman in getting the procedure the only person who wouldn't be liable to get sued in all of this is the woman who wants Wants to get the procedure herself so for me this whole aiding and abetting thing i find that to be very interesting because that essentially what it's saying is that if you're a woman and you find out that you're pregnant and you go tell someone that you want to terminate your pregnancy and this person maybe gives you a lift or they give you money for the procedure or you, you know they provide you counseling before you go get the procedure all of those people are liable to get into trouble it also means that your uber driver could be liable to get sued for driving you to the medical center if you go get your procedure my question is how does something like this actually play itself out right because does that mean that when you get into an uber your uber driver is going to be asking you what are you going to be doing at the medical facility it's wild right because that feels wildly personal to have to get into an uber to say yeah no i'm going to the doctor for this and that and i get it right because 
Uber drivers might be like, look, I'm afraid that if I take you and that's what you're going to go do, I'm liable to getting sued. So that's why I have to ask you. And it's interesting because I'm like, in all of this, I don't think people really considered the implication of something like that and how it plays itself out in real everyday life, especially when you consider how much people talk about, you know, valuing their privacy and it's none of your business. You can't ask me what or where I'm going. So when this happened, Uber and Lyft basically came out in support of their drivers and essentially said that, you know, they've got legal money on deck, you know, should their drivers get into trouble. Essentially, in my perspective, affirming the fact that they are pro-choice. The website hosting uh, platform GoDaddy also came out and said that they will not be hosting the Right to Life um, movement website thing or whatever on their platform as well. So there have been, you know, a lot of... Um, responses from corporates i'll say another thing that this law doesn't do is that it doesn't make exceptions for the instances where a woman gets pregnant through sexual assault or incest so it doesn't make any exception for that and when the texas governor uh, greg abbott was asked why there isn't an exception for sexual assault he said that texas was going to eliminate rape Now the thing that blows my mind about this law, right, is, is that the private citizen, so the person who will be bringing forth this lawsuit, right, against a woman that he doesn't even have to have a relationship with at all, so this private citizen doesn't have to have any type of relationship with this woman at all, is that when they bring this lawsuit, there's a potential that they could win up to $10,000 in damages if they win their case that's hectic because even when i think about it it is interesting that they use the word damages right because in civil litigation my understanding of it is that you win damages when someone has done something to you but this law is not saying that it's saying that a complete stranger can take another complete stranger to court and if they win they claim damages i'm like well what was done to you to be awarded damages it's all it's all very interesting. The thing about it is that it also empowers complete strangers to inject themselves into what is potentially the hardest, most complicated, most painful, most confusing time, I think, in a woman's life when she's trying to make this decision. And the thing is that it incentivizes people because there's a potential of winning $10,000. Here's the kicker to this law though. The private citizens who would be bringing forth these lawsuits, they don't actually even have to prove that the abortion took place six weeks after. So that means even what is deemed a legal abortion, which again, how can people who are pro-life really truly be supporting any of these bills blows my mind because there's still a termination that happens. But even those ones that happened before the six week mark, those ones would be, you know, vulnerable to these lawsuits as well whoa the thing about it for me is that this law at the core of it is that what it seeks to do is that it strips away any support a woman has really right because it goes after the providers and it goes after anyone who could be assisting in any kind of way so someone who gives you a lift you know your mom she gives you money your friends or whoever else or the person who's giving you counseling it strips all of that away because they're all liable to lawsuits and it really just leaves this woman alone by herself now, a lot of reproductive rights lawyers have actually said that this law isn't just about abortion and that really what this law has done is that it's going to empower people to inquire when someone loses their baby through miscarriage, right? Because now it's going to be a thing of like, well, did you actually miscarry or was it an abortion? And that is awful to think that people would be put through that process where they would have to prove to someone who's a complete stranger. And even if it's not a complete stranger, but having to prove to someone that, yeah, it actually was a miscarriage that sounds awful absolutely terrible so of course this law went to the supreme court and it was upheld and i honestly don't think anyone was surprised i mean look at what the supreme court looks like you know and you consider that there's people like brett kavanaugh different video 
So the Supreme Court now has a conservative majority and it was achieved when former President Donald Trump appointed three judges to the Supreme Court. Now Amy Barrett, I think that's how you say her surname, I'm not sure, but she was the one that was rushed to be confirmed eight days before the 2020 election and this was after Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg had passed away and now a lot of people were very very nervous because they knew that the Supreme Court having a conservative majority, especially when it comes to issues like this, was going to cause issues like this. So what have been the responses then to this law? You know, everybody is talking about it, you know, from politicians to lawyers to celebrities to corporations, you know, people have a lot to say about this. And what's been interesting is that on social media, I've been seeing, you know, the same sort of responses to this. I mean, the first one is people saying, oh, well, maybe it's not that big of a deal. You know, if you're a woman and you live in Texas, you can just go to a different state if you want to have, you know, the procedure done. And something like that, I'm like, that only works for the women who are wealthy and have the resources and the capability to be able to fly or get in their car and drive across state lines. The fear that a lot of people have is that a law like this is going to negatively impact women of color, women who are poor, women who are undocumented, and women who simply can't travel all that easily. So if you're rich, you're able-bodied, and you've got the resources, then I suppose maybe it's not a problem for you. Another thing that I've seen people say is, you know, well, don't live in Texas, then just move out. Again, this is not practical for the what, 15 million women that live in Texas. And also in this imaginary relocation scenario, like is anyone considering the cost of relocation, the cost of living in a different city, finding jobs, all of those different things. And the thing is, since this law then went to the Supreme Court and it was upheld, it's only a matter of time before the other Republican states follow suit. You know, if you think about it, they've just given them a roadmap of how to get there. Another one I've been seeing is people saying, well, you know, don't have sex if you don't want to get pregnant. Are we really supposed to sit here and believe that men are only having sex to reproduce? Like, no, Let, let's just stop with the lie. And the thing is that people who say stuff like this are people who know that laws like this will never ever apply to them men and i suppose you know women who have made that personal decision for themselves to say well they would never ever 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 terminate their pregnancy another one that i've seen people say is to say you know what if you use you know uh protection then you won't get pregnant people just need to be using protection so that they don't have children all over the place yes that's kind of the point, right? To say that there needs to be better access and affordability to birth control, which is why it's important that laws and policies are put in place to make sure people can access birth control. But while they're not allowing people to, I feel like this makes a lot of sense, does it not? And then of course, people have been highlighting the hypocrisy of Republican politicians, right? So this idea that they can, you know, pass this law that says abortion is wrong, but they can force their mistresses to have abortion or the politician who actually drove his ex-girlfriend to get an abortion and he paid half the cost or that politician that paid his mistress 1.6 million after she terminated her pregnancy see it's things like this it's it's the lack of integrity it's 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 the fact that oh no it's i can do it but you guys shouldn't be able to do it it just it absolutely blows my mind and I think that's why so many people also respond by saying people claim that they're pro-life but really they're pro-birth because if you are pro-life you would care also what happens to this child beyond because if that's the case they shouldn't be cutting funding into schools or after school lunch programs they should be thinking about things like housing providing housing providing health care for these children you know but instead they do the opposite they cut these fundings they they cut all of these programs so i'm like i can understand why people are like is it really pro-life or are you really just pro-birth this this is really a big part of the reason why i cannot stand politicians i just whew. So the last thing I will say is that there is something to be said about religious convictions being hard-coded as law. Now I did a video on this and I was talking about the separation of church and state. But besides that, the fact that people look at this as a morality issue, the question becomes, can we even legislate morality? Is that something that is to be done? 
Because the thing is with legislating morality is that just because you prohibit something in the law doesn't mean that people are not going to do it. Plenty of things have been prohibited in the law and people continue to do them. And I think the concern and the fear that a lot of people have is what this means is that there are going to be a lot of women who get hurt and there are going to be a lot of women who die, you know, from engaging in unsafe practices. Because like I was saying earlier, just because you've made it unavailable doesn't mean it's unnecessary because the reasons why women will still be going to seek out these procedures, those reasons still exist and because nothing is seemingly being done to address those concerns and those reasons to say, okay, if this is the concern, here's a policy that we can put into place to assist you with this, to assist you with that. You know, just because again, you've made it unavailable doesn't mean you've made it unnecessary and that's the fear that people have that it will go underground and there will be a lot of fatalities and a lot of people just getting injured and hurt for me though like it's it's all a lot it's it's just so much to it you know and that's why i was saying that like you know i'm more interested in having a different kind of conversation you know because we get it you either on this side or you either on that side fine but what does it mean for all the other things that are happening in the middle, you know, and where people can actually lobby and say, okay, if we want this to happen, that also needs to be changed and focusing on, okay, let's change that. Like, I guess I've been saying throughout this is that the reasons are there, you know, and, and even with that, it's not even about whether or not you agree with the reason. It isn't even about whether or not you think it's a good reason or a bad reason. The fact is for some women out there, it is a reason. You know, and I think it's it's foolish for anyone to dismiss it, to say, well, we don't care what the reasons are. We are on this side or we're on that side without saying, okay, these reasons, we are hear what people are saying. What can we do then to eliminate this if this is a concern for people and if this is a reason why people are choosing whatever it is that they're choosing? Which is why I say that regardless of which side that you fall on this, ultimately everybody should care about having things be better for everybody yeah but let me know what you guys have to say in the comments i'm really curious as to your perspectives your thoughts you know your thinking or what are some of the things we can sort of think about and think around when trying to say okay how do we make this world better for people who are living in it and what are some of the things that can be put in place to help people deal with the challenges that they're saying this is my situation but yes thank you guys for watching please like comment and subscribe and i look forward to what you guys have to say and i'll see you in the next one bye